all of our visitors and guests that are here tonight. Uh, we thank you for coming out. We, we are happy to have you with us. And I also want to um, just acknowledge something I didn't do last night, those who are listening by radio. And we appreciate all those who have tuned in. We want to ask you to get other folk to come and sit around the radio with you and listen. Or if you're driving, turn your radio up loud and turn down your windows and let uh, the, the messages go out. So we want to thank you for tuning in. We're going to get uh, right into our message tonight. Um, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew, the 25th chapter, Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse one says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto 10 virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Verse two says, and five of them were wise and five were foolish. Our message tonight is entitled, Last Day Lullabies. Last Day Lullabies. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come before your throne here tonight. Once again, I ask that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. And then, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ upon that nail. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So we'll go back to Matthew 24 for just a second. In Matthew 24, it says, And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. His disciples came privately asking him questions. When shall these things be? When shall the sign of your coming and the end of the world be? Jesus said to them, take heed that no man deceive you. And remember, that word deceive in the Greek is planeos. It means to be led away like a sheep. Now, Jesus gives all of the examples of the prophecies being fulfilled that we discussed last, last night and the night before. But Jesus does something else. To make his point, he speaks in parables. Amen? And in these parables are incredible truths for us. Matthew 25 is no different. And if you understand the fullness and the meaning of this parable, it will help you to be ready when Jesus returns. Now, the title of the message tonight is Last Day Lullabies. Now, a lullaby is something that you sing to a child to help them to fall asleep. It's a song usually a mother will sing, and by singing this song night after night, the child knows from the, 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 the tone of the mother's voice, from the words of the song, from the melody of the song, it's time to go to bed. And as they hear this song sung, at night the child does what? They go to sleep. I want to submit to you that you have to be careful in these last days. For the enemy also has lullabies. And the enemy wants to sing certain songs to you, do certain things to you that will put you to sleep spiritually. This is a story about sleeping. Matthew 25 verse 1 says that the kingdom of heaven was like ten virgins. They took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. I'm just going to read the parable first and then we'll break it down. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps while the bridegroom tarried. They all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your lamps. Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Verse 9. But the wise answered, saying, No, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and do what? And buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. 
And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also of the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But, that, but he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Verse 13, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. It's an interesting story, and you can't really understand the story unless you get the context of what a marriage was like in ancient Israel at the time of Jesus. It was a long process, and we've been talking about marriage every night as well, and a long pro process. In fir at first, the couple had to become engaged, and when they got engaged, uh, there was a, a, a betrothal that happened. There was a, a commitment that was made. Neither of them could go be with anyone else, but they could not get married. They couldn't do like folk do now, get you know, elope and run off and get married. There was a, a year-long wait that had to happen, and during that year-long wait, the man often had to um, come up with dowry money and build a house and prepare a place so that the, there was some way, somewhere for this family to start off, right? It's not wise to get married and you have nothing. Love is a very good thing, but it does not buy groceries. It doesn't pay light bill. It can't turn the water on. Love is real beautiful, but then that company's not going to call you and say, listen, I, you owe us some money, but if you love your wife enough, we'll just say, all right, don't keep, you know, you don't have to pay. You got to actually have some money. So the way the system was set up, you had a year. That man would work extra. He could work with his friends. He could do what he needed to do to get a nest egg, as we say in the States, of money so that he could take care of his wife. It was a long process. The Bible refers to this in the story of Joseph and Mary, remember? And the story of Jesus, you remember? Joseph was, he was, Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but they weren't really fully married yet. And that's why Joseph, the Bible says he was going to put her away what? Privately. He, during that year, she had to stay faithful to him, but they weren't married yet. This was a long process. So you have to understand that when the time finally came that they were going to get married, it was a time of celebration. And what would happen is the bridegroom would leave from his house, and there are different ways that this would happen, but in general, the bridegroom would leave from his house and he would march with his friends and with some singers and with lamps and they would march at twilight when the sun was going down all the way across the village from his house to the house where he was to go and get his wife. And it was a march. And the, 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 if you study the history, as they would march through the village, they would sing songs, romantic songs, songs of love. People who weren't even invited would join along and sing, and everybody would be singing, and they had their lamps. And so it was like this, a, 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 as the sun went down, it was like a, a, a parade lit up. And as they would march, people would just join because they wanted to just celebrate the love that was happening. But a lot of times, the bridegroom would be slow to get out of the house. He had to wait for his friends to get there. They had to light the lamps. They were waiting for this to happen, that to happen. So it wasn't uncommon that the bridegroom would be delayed. In fact, uh, when I went to Israel, you can sit on the Mount of Olives to this day. And, and this is where many say Jesus was sitting with his disciples after in Matthew chapter 24. And as they were looking down in the valley, they could see one of these marriage processionals going across. And Jesus then told this parable as he sees this happening probably. Now what's incredible is that as they're approaching the house where the bride is, the bride's friends who are the bride's maids, they are standing out in front of the house and they are supposed to have their lamps lit so that the bridegroom and his lights, his parade lights, meet up with the house that is all lit up. Light meets what? Light. And it's a beautiful thing. So everything's lit up. It's dark. Remember, they don't have electric lights back then. So everything is lit up and the bride's maids are standing there with their lamps lit. And that's the way it's supposed to work. 
And as he comes across town to meet with his bride, everyone is watching. There's a big processional. Everyone is supposed to be ready. But if it takes too long, folk start to fall asleep. So it says, Matthew 25 says, The kingdom of heaven will be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. I'll give you some, some, some of what this means. Uh, one of them is that the virgins represent what? Believers. The virgins aren't non-believers. These are not non-Christians. The virgins represent people who go to church, who, who believe in God. The lamps, the lamps represent the word of God. You get that? So the word of God is to light up the house where the bride is. What house is the bride in? The house that the bride is in right now is called planet Earth. So the word of God is to light up this planet. In a dark world, the word of God is to be the light. Amen? And the bridegroom is the coming Jesus Christ. It is the returning of our Lord. So that's the first set of, of definitions. The Bible then says that five of them were wise. And five of them were what? Foolish. It doesn't say that five of them were good and five of them were bad. It says that five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. We'll come back to that in a second. The third verse says, they, they that were foolish took their lamps, but they did not take oil with them. But the wise ones took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So, oil represents the Holy Spirit. And if there's one thing I want you to get from the message tonight, is the importance of the Holy Spirit in the last days. We're going to go into some heavier doctrine this week, the state of the dead, what happens when you die. We're going to talk about the judgment. We're going to talk about the mark of the beast, the seal of God. Do people really burn in hell forever? What is heaven like? We're going to hit a lot of topics. But before you get into doctrine, one of the things that's most important is that you have the Holy Spirit, that you understand its importance because the Bible tells us that it is the Holy Spirit that will lead you into what? All truth. The problem a lot of folk have is they're trying to decipher truth without the aid of the Holy Spirit. And here's what the lesson tells you so far, already from the parable. You are foolish if you try and give light without the Holy Spirit. you got to have the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and they slept. The bridegroom took longer than it was supposed to, he was supposed to take, and the bridesmaids fell asleep. You got to imagine, for the bridesmaids, this was a long day. They had to get up early in the morning. They had to still do all the chores and work around their houses for their families. Then they had to get dressed. I mean, they had to go get their hair done, their nails did. They had to do all of that stuff. They had to get right. They had to put on their clothes. They had to press the clothes. They had to be ready. They had to put on whatever else they were putting on. They had to go wait for... For, for, uh, to go over to the bride's house and wait. It was a long day. So, And remember, the wedding didn't start till the sun started to go down. So you can imagine, if they'd been up from early in the morning, when it starts getting dark, they're tired. And they actually start to fall asleep. It's not, it's not unreasonable that they fall asleep, but the lesson is that all 10 of them fall asleep. Wise and foolish fall asleep. The Bible then says this. At midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. At midnight, a cry is made. We call this the midnight cry. Midnight re represents Earth's darkest hour. And right now, we've been talking about this last couple of nights, we are in Earth's darkest hour. We have never seen the planet in the condition it's in. The planet is so bad right now that even people who don't believe in God are saying that because of climate change and, 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 and um, global warming, they're predicting the end of the world. So even it's not just Christians predicting the end of the world anymore. Even the secular folk are saying, listen, the world is coming to an end. We have to stop using oil and all this other stuff. Earth is at a dark hour. In fact, Bill Gates recently came out with a statement where he says that he is warning of a new pandemic, a new global disease that he thinks is going to kill more than 30 million people. 
There, the world is, is, is in a dark place. We talked about the violence, and you can see, I left, I left my clicker. From the, from the pictures here, this is one of the mass shootings in the United States. Where somebody walked into a restaurant called Waffle House at night, and they just shot and killed all of five of these people, one, two, three, four people, right there in the Waffle House, sitting there minding their own business at night. I told you guys earlier in the week that in the United States, it has gotten so scary with the gun violence that churches now have to do um, active shooter drills. We actually have to practice in our churches in the States. We did this at my church where we have to, if we have to actually have a drill during divine service, 11 o'clock hour on Sabbath, the police come and we have to actually figure out if a shooter comes, which direction are you going to run in? Sounds crazy, but I'm I've been very close to some of these active shooting things. One of them was just up the street from Loma Linda University. Um, and we, we've had some scary close calls. In the United States, this is happening, but this type of violence isn't really unique to the United States. The United States is having some bad goes because this one is actually in Toronto, Canada, where it's much more difficult to get a gun. Instead, this young man got into a, he rented a van from Ryder, a uh, truck rental company and took the truck and began to run people over in the middle of the street in the street he went up on the sidewalk that's not the street and began to run pedestrians over to do a mass killing with just a van the scripture says at midnight a cry is made you see the point there's a point that where it comes where, where God says listen enough is enough and a cry is going to be made, and Jesus is going to say, that's it. I've got to go and redeem my people. The earth's wickedness is too much. Thank you. And at that point, it's critically important that you be ready, because when he makes that cry, what happens is, it says here, the bridegroom comes, he says, the bridegroom's coming, go out to meet him. And when that happens, verse 7 says, then all those virgins arose. All of them trim their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. So the way that these lamps looked, they were, they were poles, and there were bowls on the top. There was a wick of cloth in the top, and you had to pour the oil down into the, into the top, and you light the wick, and it would brighten up, and boom, it would be a big, this wasn't a little lamp like you carry here around your house, a little kerosene lamp. These were big lamps that, you, that stood up on sticks and had big bowls in the top. So in order to keep it lit, so everybody trimmed their lamp, meaning the foolish forgot to some extent that there was no oil for their lamp. When they trimmed it and went to light it, they realized their lamp was dry. There was no oil in their lamp. And their initial response is to turn to the other five and say, hey, give us some of your oil. Now, some folks say it's pretty mean what the other five do, but, but we'll, we'll address that here in a second. One Bible scholar says it like this. He says, it is a warning addressed specifically to those inside the profession church who are not to assume that their future is unconditionally assured. All 10 are expecting to be at the feast, and until the moment comes, there is no apparent difference between them. This is what I want you to get. It is the crisis which will divide the ready from the unready. What will divide the ready from the unready? Crisis. Crisis will divide the ready from the unready. Right now, everybody goes to church. Everybody looks like a Christian. Everybody dresses up and looks good. Every Saturday in this country, every Sunday, everybody looks the same. But when the crisis comes, that's when you're going to find out who's got their oil for their lamp. The wise answer is saying, not so. Lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. So I made up these two equations. One, the first lesson here is you can't borrow somebody else's Christianity. Amen? I grew up, my grandmother was a God-fearing woman. She's, she's, she's no longer uh, alive now. 
she was a God-fearing woman. My God, my grandmother tells us stories that growing when she was in Jamaica, that um, that she would have uh, episodes where um, um, she one of the well, she had seven children. One of them was sick once, and she didn't go to church on that Sabbath. My grandmother tells us the story that the angel of the Lord showed up at her house. And my mother and my Aunt Doreen tell the story that sure enough, something happened and it was like an angel showed up at the house. My grandmother is the only one that understood what the angel says. And the angel said, to tell, told my grandmother, never miss another Sabbath service again in your life. My grandmother was close with God in, in Jamaica. I told you in Jamaica, we don't call it juju or voodoo. They call it obia. And the women who practiced obia were against my grandmother because she was such a God-fearing woman. And they put together and they began to make spell and incantation against my grandmother to put a curse on her. And my grandmother and my mother and my aunts tell the story, they could hear horses running around the house. Before the night was over, they could hear horses running above the house, and the house was shaking. And my grandmother got herself and all of her children, because my grandfather was driving trucks, and they got on their knees and they began to pray and call on the name of the Lord. And she says they stood, and my mother says they were up all night to the point where the kids fell asleep. And when they woke up, they could still hear my grandmother praying. The next day when my grandmother was out putting clothes on the line, nothing happened to the house, everyone was safe. One of the women that was trying to put the, the spell or the curse on my grandmother came over to my grandmother and in the Jamaican part I said, Mrs., I what kind of magic you work in? The lady said, because we worked all night to try and destroy your family. And it didn't come on you, it came on us. My grandmother was close to God. Watch this. I'll tell you all of that to tell you my grandmother's faith can't save me. Despite the fact that my grandmother was, was, my grandmother prayed, it was like God stopped what he was doing to respond. Her faith can't save me. Young people, the faith of your parents, your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents, their faith cannot save you. You've got to know Jesus for yourself. You've got to have a relationship with him for yourself. You can't one day hope that you can get their oil and put it in your lamp. Doesn't work that way. Doctrine minus the Holy Spirit turns into empty form and even legalism. But if you have an unholy spirit and you have no doctrine, people often become self-empowered and they will become lawless. This story says that it takes truth and the Holy Spirit together. And as we go through the rest of the week and we get into the deep doctrines and we get heavier into things, I want you to remember to pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to guide you as we discuss and as we study deep spiritual things. Because what I've learned, and I, I have two doctoral degrees, and I've learned that you cannot necessarily logically convince people of what is true. It takes more than that sometimes. And in the spiritual realm, it definitely takes the abiding of the Holy Spirit. So I want to challenge you this week to not be like the five foolish virgins. I want to challenge you to begin to pray from now for the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work in your life. Amen? It says here in the parable of the ten virgins, in the parable, all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time there was seen no difference between them. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming. All have a knowledge of the scriptures. All have heard the message of Christ's near approach and confidently expect his appearing. But as in the parable, so it is now. A time of waiting intervenes. Faith is tried, and when the cry is heard, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of the what? Of the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is of what? No avail. The theory of truth unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, 
But unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Ha! So the foolish aren't just foolish because they don't have oil for their lamps. The foolish are foolish because they have a character defect. In essence, it is spiritual procrastination. The idea that I can always get ready tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes and say, you know what? I'll get to know God next week. I'll, I'll start going back to church in two weeks. I'll start to study my Bible again in four weeks. And you keep, as we say in America, kicking the can down the street until finally you have to pay the piper. Well, we're going to talk about death this week. Let me tell you something. I, I preach a lot about the soon coming. As a doctor, I can tell you, you ought to be more, you, we, I don't know, we don't know the day nor the hour when Jesus comes, but I can tell you, you won't live forever even if he waits 200 years to come. You will one day have to deal with death. The Bible says it is appointed to every man that he shall die, and then the what? And then the judgment. We're going to talk about judgment this week as well. I'm telling you, you can't continually kick the can. And a lot of folk think they're going to wait for a deathbed experience, and then they'll come to know Jesus. You, you, you may not be... You may not have a conscious mind on that deathbed to make such a decision. So I challenge you right now to begin the process of getting the Holy Spirit and getting ready for Jesus' soon return. The, don't let the character defect of spiritual procrastination cause you to not be ready. Because the truth of the matter is when it comes to the second coming or preparing for the end, it's not about getting ready, it's about being ready. You have to be ready. Without the enlightenment of the Spirit, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error, and they will fall under the masterful temptations of what? Satan. So when we talk about the deceptions this week, we want to talk about how is it that the whole world believes that when you die, you're still alive? How is it that people, to this day, sensible people believe they can communicate with dead people? I told you about that the other night. I'm not into that kind of stuff. If somebody's dead, they should rest in peace. Don't talk, come around me talking about you bringing somebody back from the dead, because you and I will not be friends anymore. That'll be the last conversation we have. But how are they so deceived? How are they deceived about the judgment People now believe God is just going to let everybody into heaven. No one is going to be judged in, the, in a direction that, that is unpleasant. Those deceptions come because people don't have the spirit of the living God to lead them past those deceptions. Matthew 25 and verse 10 says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So the bridegroom shows up. The five are ready. Their lights are, lamp, are lit up. The house is lit up. He comes with his lamps and his crew. They're singing and carrying on. I was watching. I don't know if they had a wedding here on Sunday, but they had some music out there. And, boy, you Ghanaians can dance. Boy, those people were cutting the rug out there by the swimming pool. And I said, that's how it is. They were coming to that house, and they were celebrating. And they celebrated right into the house. And the five were at the store looking for oil, the foolish five. When they get back to the house, is there really a purpose for them if their job is to have the house lit up when the bridegroom gets to the house? Have they not failed the very reason they were asked to be bridesmaids? They have completely failed in their charge as bridesmaids. So the Bible says in verse 11, Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And you can see the, 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 the door, it probably slid back a piece of wood, looked through the door of the house. And he answered, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. He doesn't know them. Because his his reason for knowing them is tied to the purpose they were to serve. 
If they were standing there with the lamps, he knows who they are. Those are his wife's friends, the bridesmaids. If they're not there when he gets there, then he disqualifies them as the friend of the bride. He doesn't know who they are, and he's not just going to let anybody in. There's only a limited amount of stuff in the wedding feast, so he won't let them in. He says, I don't know you. Verse 13 says, watch, be careful, for you don't know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Be careful, because you don't know the exact day. We know the road signs. We know what's coming soon, but you don't know the exact day, and I'm telling you, we are closer to the end than many people think. I told you the other night that uh, um, when Russia, the Soviet Union was still in existence, and they had this giant communist conglomerate of atheists, there were some who said, listen, the Soviet Union will never fall. The mighty Soviets will never go down. The gospel will never go in. They had wiped out the Russian Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, Catholics, Baptists, Seventh-day Adventists, shut down the churches. Pastors were tortured, and there's a, a good Christian movie, um, um, Tortured for Christ, that you can watch about the pastor in Romania um, through um, 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 the, the, the martyrs, worldwide martyrs movement, and if you watch that movie, you can see how the Soviet Union tortured Christians. Folks said it will never happen that Christianity goes into the, those areas. And in, in the 1980s, under Ronald Reagan, when Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States, it almost seemed like it happened overnight. Bam. The Berlin Wall came down in Germany, separating East Germany from West Germany, and it seemed like in a night the gospel flooded the Soviet, former Soviet Union. Seventh-day Adventist Church put up churches all over that part of Europe. Overnight. Because we are told that the last events will be what? They'll be rapid. Do not think that God has to work, wait forever to do what he wants to do. God is waiting for some of us to get oil in our lamps. He can finish the work. He's waiting for some of us who don't have oil in our lamps. That's, that's really the delay because Christ is coming for people whose characters look like his. That's why the scripture says, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess but be filled with the Spirit. And you know what the devil wants everybody to be now? Filled with wine. Somebody sent me today a thing where there's a company in Toronto where they will pay you $1,000 a month, I think it is, to smoke weed. So you can get a job. Somebody's smiling. You look, hey, don't, don't go after that job. I'm going to tell them to deny your visa. $1,000 a month, that's a lot of money. And all you got to do is smoke weed. Isn't that crazy? Only in North America they do something crazy like that. On every, if you watch a football game in America, a basketball game, a golf tournament, tennis, almost every other commercial is beer, vodka, wine. It's constant barrage of the minds of the people of this world over alcohol and drugs. The legalization of marijuana in much of North America now and even parts of Europe. We are watching the devil say, listen, I am going to intoxicate the world. There's a reason that when you go to a liquor store in the United States, you know what it says? Spirits sold here. Alcohol is called spirits. That's another name for it. Because when you drink alcohol, you open yourself up to what? Spirits. That's why the Bible says here, listen, be careful. Don't be drunk with the wine of this world. That's excess. What we ought to be looking to be is filled with the what? Filled with the spirit. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. But they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon, upon the rock. Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. The class, this class, are represented also by the stony ground hearers. They receive the word with readiness, but they fail of assimilating its principles. Its influence is not abiding. The Spirit works upon man's heart according to desire and consent, uh, implanting in him a new nature. But the class represented the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. They do not know God. 
They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Their service to God, watch this, it degenerates into a form. Ezekiel says, they come unto thee as the people cometh. And they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For the, with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. The Apostle Paul points out that this will be the special characteristic of those who live just before Christ's second coming. He says, in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but what? Denying the power thereof. What is the power? It's the Holy Spirit. But denying the power that would make them actually be godly. This is the class that in time of peril are found crying peace and safety. They lull their hearts into security and dream not of danger. When startled from their lethargy, they discern their destitution and entreat others to supply their lack. But in spiritual things... No man can make up another's deficiency. Did you see that? And spiritual things, what's wrong with you, your pastor can't fix. He can't make it up. Satan is well aware that the weakest soul who abides in Christ is more than a match for the host of darkness. And that he should reveal, and, should he, and that should he reveal himself openly, he would be met and resisted. Therefore, he seeks to draw away the soldiers of the cross from their strong fortification. 1 John 3, 6 says, Whosoever abides in him sinneth not. So the lullabies become very tangible. The ten virgins weren't hypocrites. The five foolish weren't hypocrites. They wanted to do right. How does the devil take you who have gone to church your whole life, you know who God is, at least on a superficial level, how does the devil get those folk and lead them away from God when, the, when you know that if the devil just shows up directly, you're going to resist him. So Satan has a strategy, and these are the lullabies that he will use to get you to not only to sleep, but get you to be moved away from the safe place you have in Christ. In the book Steps to Christ, page 71, it says, when the mind dwells upon self, you get that? When, it's, when it dwells upon self, it is turned away from Christ the source of strength and life. Hence, it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ. So what does the devil do? Steps to Christ, page 71, gives you five lullabies, five things the devil does to get you to be pulled away from Christ and to follow the world. Five things. And you have to understand, if you're a Christian, even if you're a Christian superficially, the devil can't just come at you with the craziest worldly things. He's not going to get you with cocaine or, or prostitutes. Hopefully not. He's going to have to come much more subtly than that. You understand what I'm saying? He's going to have to come more slick than that. And so he, what he comes at you with sometimes isn't of itself wrong. I want you to get that. So what does he do? He comes at you with the pleasures of the world. And he figures that if he can get you caught up in the pleasures of the world, you'll be so caught up with this that you'll be, again, begin to stop communion, communing with God. So what do I mean? It's probably not wrong to watch a football game. Every TV here in the hotel has a football game on. Uh, we call it soccer, it's football. And so, you know, but you know what the devil will do? It gets you so caught up in Manchester United or Liverpool or Man City. Or he'll get you caught up in, what's the one in Spain, uh, Real Madrid, right? He'll get you so caught up in the teams and you are so all into it that when they change a player and they move one from, from this town to the next town, you following them. And then if they got Ghanaian players, you rooting for your Ghanaian players. And you just studying this thing, studying this thing, studying this thing. Watch this. Until the sport begins to consume you. You get what I'm saying? All by itself, it's probably not a big deal. But the devil knows that if he can get you caught up 
in the pleasures of the world, sports, entertainment, the songs of the world, the movies of the world. If he can pull you into this stuff, he can pull you away from Christ. Because it just takes a little bit of misdirection and you'll be pulled away from him. But the second one is life's cares, perplexities, and sorrows. The devil will get it so that bad things happen in your life. You don't have a job. You have a hard time making money. One of your loved ones dies. And you will focus so much on what's wrong in your life, the cares of your life, that you focus so much on yourself, you stop focusing on Christ. Watch this. That's why the Christian cannot respond to difficulty and tragedy by focusing on themselves, the Christian, like the three Hebrew boys, about to walk into the furnace, has to focus on Christ and his abilities. Because if not, the difficulties of this life will cause you to walk away from God. And I've seen that happen many times. If someone loves, someone's loved one dies, and the person walks away from God because they're upset that they lost their loved one. The third one is the faults of others. A lot of folk will leave. My brother was coming back. My brother got into the hip-hop world and the nightclub world. He's making big, big money doing this. And he met a lot of the big stars that all of you guys know, Jay-Z and all these people. And he was making all this money. And, he, and my mother died. I'll tell you that story later on in the week. And my brother decided after her death that he should start coming back to church. He didn't have any more church clothes. He had hip-hop jeans and boots and sneakers and big shirts that they wear and when he walked into the church our old church the pastor's wife jumped up and said get out you know better than to come here dressed like that my brother was trying to come back to Christ and he got so mad he got in his car and drove off he talked to me later on he started and he was listening to my sermons online and stuff and he said he was convicted again that he should go to church. And he found another church to go to where they didn't care what he was wearing. And he's been going to that church ever since. He's a very involved. He wears a suit and tie to church every week now. You see, you can't give up on God because some folk are quick to judge what you look like on the outside. Some folk mouth is like oral diarrhea. They just talk foolishness. And you can't let what folks say disturb your relationship with the great God of the universe. The scripture said, Jesus says, I am the word. That's how John starts. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The only word that matters is the word of God. But the fourth one, we'll talk more about this later on in the week too. But the fourth one is this one. Your own faults and imperfections. The devil will have you caught up in the fact that you have not given up cheese yet or that you still eating this or you still doing that. The devil, you're still impatient, that you quick to tell people off. Some of y'all are too fast to give people a piece of your mind. You need your mind. Keep it. <laughs> and so you'll say, look, I'm not making any progress, Lord. And you get frustrated with yourself. You see that? And you know what the devil is? He is the accuser of the brethren. So guess what? He's going to remind you of all your faults because he wants to discourage you and make you think you're too far from God. You might as well leave him alone. That's what the devil will do. So one of the lullabies he'll give you is this one. He'll say, listen, you're too messed up. You're too imperfect, Walsh. Just give up on God and move away. Eventually you start feeling uncomfortable coming to church. You, you stop seeking the fellowship of other believers. And this happens. But another one, especially among some of us in our denomination, is this one. Anxiety and fear as to whether we shall be saved. Some of you are so worried about whether or not you're going to be saved. You're so, so perplexed in what's going to happen to you that you start to doubt God. Let me tell you something. You do your part giving your sin to God, being seriously repentant. You give him your time. You give him your worship. And then you have to believe and trust that the blood of Christ washes away sin. When you stop trusting the blood, the demons get power. When you stop trusting the blood of Jesus, the enemy gains power. 
And one of the, the last day lullabies is to try and get you to think there is no way that you could ever be saved. And I'm here to tell you that if you start to think like that, you're in trouble. Your hope, and the song says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. But all this turns the soul away from the source of our strength. I only have a couple minutes, but I want to give you a closing story. I have a cousin who was drafted number five overall for the National Football League, our American version of football, our American sport called football. And if you know what that means, that's huge, because if you go number 200, you're still probably going to make a lot of money. He went number five, one, two, three, four, five. He signed with the Washington Redskins in Washington, D.C., and he signed a contract for 36 million U.S. dollars. 36 million. You know how much money? That's a lot. Even in America, that's a lot of money. In fact, in America, it's so much money, folks start losing their mind when you start talking about $36 million. And he was, he was, he was, he was uh, ready to play for the National Football League. He was one of the best football players coming out of college. Absolutely one of the best. He played a position called safety. So he was one of, on the defense, and he would hit people. And this kid, from, from my cousin, was a little kid. He would, just, he would hide on the couch. You'd be walking by, he'd jump up, bam, and just knock you over. And I was bigger than him. He'd still do it. He liked hitting people. I mean, the kid just liked it. So he's perfect for football, American football. And so he, he play, I watched him play Pop Warner, and he played high school. In fact, he went to high school where Madonna sent her kids to high school, the, the singer Madonna. And he won that school their first state championship in football, Gulliver Prep in Miami, Florida. He wanted time for him to go to college. Everybody wanted him. He wound up staying in Miami and going to the University of Miami where I went to medical school. And he won a, a national championship in college the very first year he played the University of Miami won a national championship in Pasadena, California at the Rose Bowl. His career was on par. It, he was just doing incredibly well. He had some, some difficulties, some, some challenges from childhood that he was still dealing with. And so he got in trouble. He, was, he, he had a bad attitude. He would, like, fight with other players really easy and, and little things like that. And he got a bad reputation. Uh, and he was in the NFL, and he started to – he got into trouble because someone stole his um, – his four-wheel, they, they call them ATVs in these states. And, you know, you sit, they ride them out in the dirt, out in the, I don't do that kind of stuff. But they go out in the back way place and, and ride these four-wheelers. And somebody stole them. And our old neighborhood is, I mean, part of it is, part of it is really ghetto. And so you don't really play around with people in that neighborhood. Because when I was growing up, that was the, one of the crack cocaine capitals of the entire United States. So there were some real, real bad boys over on the other side of the main street from us. And he went over there and drew guns on some guys and got his stuff back. Those guys called the police on him. But they, they called the police and they still did a drive-by on his friend's house. So while he and his friends are in the house, they go and they shoot up the house. Sean said that while they were shooting up the house, his truck looked like Swiss cheese from all the bullet holes. He said they were in the backyard of the house and they were still ducking bullets coming through the car, through the front of the house, through the back of the house, ducking bullets in the backyard, hiding under the barbecue. He started to change, because now he was in trouble with the law. People were after him for his life. And in that off-season, he came back to church. He was a pathfinder. He sang in the choir at the church. He was at Grazer at Seventh-day Adventist. And he started coming back to church. And when they made the appeal, he took the appeal. And he came down front. I saw him at one of our cousin's um, baby, blessed, baby shower things, and he was saying, look, he said, Rick, they call me Rick, he said, Rick, when this football thing is over, man, he said, I'm coming back to church. He said, I want to be a Christian. He said, he said, listen, you don't know who you can trust in this sports game. Everybody's after you for your money. You don't know who you can trust. I want, I'm going to come back to church when it's all over. He hurt his knee. The next season, he's having his best professional season ever, and he hurt his knee. And he, he didn't fly back with the team from Tampa Bay, Florida, to Washington, D.C. He came to Miami because he was hurt after the game in Tampa Bay to check on his boat. He had a giant fishing boat and a mansion and a, and a nice BMW. So he was coming to check on his stuff. And he was there with his girlfriend, and they had a baby. And while he was there, some boys broke into the back of the house. 
And the boy had a gun. One of the boys had a gun. It was four boys. Two stayed in the car. Two broke in the back of the house. He came out. I can tell you our family's Jamaican. So he come out with a machete because he was no longer allowed to have guns because he'd gotten in trouble. And when he comes out with the machete, the other boy sees him and they're afraid of him and they shoot him in the leg. I don't even know that the boy really wanted to hurt him. But when the bullet hit him, it hit him in his femoral artery and he began to bleed. The femoral artery is your biggest artery in your leg. And he's a world-class athlete, so his body is pumping the blood out very quickly. He falls to the ground. He begins to bleed. His girlfriend is hiding in the closet with the baby. Maybe if she'd come out sooner, she could have helped him. But he begins to bleed out. They call an ambulance. The ambulance takes him to a helicopter. Helicopter airlifts him to the Ryder Trauma Center, where I did my trauma surgery training when I was at the University of Miami. They give him $60,000 worth of something called albumin, a protein to try and keep his blood vessels um, a patent and try and keep fluid in his blood vessels. They give him blood. They give him, they give him um, normal saline. They try to keep him alive. They work over hard trying to keep him alive. But watch this. My grandmother, the same grandmother I told you about, she comes in and sits by him, and she begins, you can hear her singing hymns. My brother was telling, I'm still in California. My brother's telling, she's singing hymns in his ears. She's reciting words in his ears, verses in his ears. And she's sitting there, sitting there, sitting there. Two or three days go by. He's still unconscious. He's still laying there. The doctor comes in as my grandmother's sitting there. My grandmother's not gotten up. She hasn't showered. She hasn't barely moved from the chair in two days. The doctor comes in and says, Sean, and a nurse comes in. The nurse puts her hands in his hand and says, Sean, if you can hear me, squeeze the nurse's hand. And he squeezes her hand. And he says, Sean, if you can hear me, blink. And he blinks. And the doctor and the nurse leave. When the doctor and the nurse leave, my grandmother gets up, starts packing up her stuff and tells my brother, take me to go take a shower. And my brother is like, now? It seems like something might be happening. My brother is sitting on ESPN and on CNN. They say, oh, Sean Taylor may live. You know, the positive sign, this and that and the other. My brother calls me in California and says, I know what they're saying on the news, but Sean looks bad. I don't see how he can make it. Within 24 hours, my cousin died. I got on a plane in California, flew across the United States to Miami to go to the funeral. When I saw my grandmother, and at the funeral, O.J. Simpson is there, all the football players are there. It was a, it was a circus. But I looked for my grandmother. I got to my grandma and said, Mama, why is it that you were praying for two, three days straight for him to be healed, it seems, and when you got a sign that he, he blinked and he squeezed the hand, why, Mama, did you then get up and leave? My grandmother says she was singing to him the hymns she used to sing to him when he was a little boy. She was re reciting to him the Sabbath school lessons she used to teach him when he was a little boy. She was giving him the Bible verses of the assurance of salvation and that if he can hear her, he can still be saved. And she prayed. She said, I'm tired, Lord. I need to know that he can hear me. And when she prayed that prayer, the doctor and the nurse walked in. And when she realized that he could still hear her, my grandmother said her work was done. She got up and she left and she got dressed. And she prepared for the funeral. She said there comes a point when either you're ready or you're not. And he had all the information he needed to make a decision for the Lord. And that was her job and she was done. Let me tell you something, church. When my cousin was buried, there was no big truck behind him carrying his BMW. They didn't bury his boat with him. All his fancy clothes, all the jewelry, none of it got buried with him. Well, maybe they buried a little bit of jewelry, but the rest of it was all in the house. Somebody else will spend all the money that was left. Somebody else will get all of that money. It won't be me. My point to you is, if he died safe in the arms of Jesus, he died with everything he needed. And I'm here to tell you tonight that the world offers you lots of riches. They, there are many things the world will offer you. But if you die and you don't know Christ, whatever you gained in this life was more of an anchor to this world than it was a blessing. So I challenge you tonight. Will you be like the five wise or like the five foolish? If you want to be like the five wise and have your 
lamp trimmed and burning. If you want to have the oil of the Holy Spirit in your life, I want you to stand with me tonight as we close out in prayer. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Father, because you have been better to us than we have been to ourselves. And Lord, we know that this world is challenging, it's difficult. Lord, we know that death comes and trial comes, tribulation comes. We know, Lord, that the devil will send great pleasures towards us to distract us and lead us away. But Father God, we pray tonight that we would not be led astray by the, by the lullabies of the enemy. That instead, Father God, we would watch and be sober. We'd be awake with our lamps trimmed and burning brightly, Lord. And that we would have oil in our vessels, the oil of the Holy Ghost, ready for when Jesus returns. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. amen. And amen. You may be seated.